All right, everyone, um, welcome to today's midweek mixer on reimagining meat. So today we're gonna explore pathways into the alternative protein field, um, specifically for scientists focused on fats and oils. So my name is Christina Aguila and I work for the Good Food Institute. Um, if you're not familiar with GFI, um, you'll hear a lot more about um, our work in the following presentation, but uh, we're an international nonprofit working to build a sustainable, healthy, and just global food system by accelerating the alternative protein field. And by alternative proteins, I'm referring to meat, dairy, and eggs made without the animal. Um, so before we get started, uh, I would just wanna give a huge thank you to AOCS for hosting this mixer, um, because there is a really, really significant and urgent need for scientists with deep understandings of fats and oils. So we, we're just beyond grateful for the opportunity to um, get to speak with you all about career and research opportunities in this emerging field. Um, so Priya, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so before we get started, uh, it would be great if all of you could um, edit your name in Zoom to, um, to add your affiliation. So whatever organization or university um, or company you're coming from. Um, and uh, I think a lot of folks already started doing this, but feel free to introduce yourself in the chat area. Um, I see we have folks joining us from literally all over the globe today, which is just super exciting. So yeah, please say hello. Um, and also just so you know how the event will uh, will uh, like the structure of the event, uh, we're gonna have both speakers pre present first and then we'll have a combined Q&A at the very end. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat um, as they come up so that you don't forget them, but just know that we'll um, address them towards the end. Um, and yeah, this meeting will be recorded also for future viewing. Um, and Priya, if you could go on to the next slide. Cool, so um, our agenda, for today, um, at this point, I'm thrilled to introduce two brilliant, inspiring scientists in the alternative protein space. So first up, we're going to hear from Dr. Priera Pinescu, uh, one of my colleagues from the Good Food Institute, who is the senior scientist that specializes in plant-based meat. And then afterwards, we're going to hear from Dr. Alejandro Marangoni, who is a professor and tier one Canada research chair at the University of Guelph. So they're each gonna give a presentation. Um, and again, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So um, drop your questions in the chat. And um, yeah, I think that's it for housekeeping notes. So at this point, I'll pass the speaker baton on to Pri um, and feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful being here today and seeing everybody popping into the chat and talking to you guys about fats and oils and alternative protein space. My name is Priya Paneski. Thank you so much, Christina, for that really amazing intro. And yes, I'm really excited to talk about pathways specifically for scientists who are focused on fats and oils into the alternative protein field. And before that, I do want to dive in a little bit deeper onto G GFI. So for those of us, uh, those of you who are not familiar yet, um, the Good Food Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're developing a roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein system. We're 100% powered by philanthropy, and we have six affiliate um, offices all around the globe. I am part of the GFI US team along with Christina. We also have GFI Europe, GFI APAC, GFI India, GFI um, Brazil, and GFI Israel. And we have over 100 team members around the globe, and we really focus on three strategic areas. The first of which is the science and technology team, which Christina and I both sit on. And here we focus on advancing foundational open access research in alternative proteins and creating a thriving research and training ecosystem around these game-changing fields. Our corporate engagement team partners with companies and investors around the globe to drive investment, accelerate innovation, and scale the supply chain all faster than market forces would be able to do so on their own. And finally, our policy team does an amazing job advocating for fair policy and public research funding for alternative proteins. And the key question GFI is really working on when looking at alternative proteins and trying to make them no longer alternative is really how are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050? As the UN predict, predicts, we'll have 10 billion people 
who will be eating a lot more protein than people do now by 2050. So how are we going to do that in a way that doesn't destroy our planet in the meantime? We wanna do this sustainably, efficiently, and safely. And industrial agriculture is one of the top two to three most significant contributors to the world's most pressing environmental issues. So for instance, industrial animal agriculture is responsible for about 15% of greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's higher than the direct emissions from the entire transportation sector um, put together. So that's just putting everything in a little bit of perspective. It also uses industrialized animal agriculture also uses 75% of our agricultural land. That's a huge portion, especially considering that it only provides about 33% of global protein supply. And it's also the number one user of medically important antibiotics. So really we're answering how can we get protein demand, food demand for all these people by 2050 without destroying our planet in the meantime. And alternative meat products are the top emerging technology to accommodate growing protein demands while promoting planetary health. And GFI is specifically focused on how we can make alternative meats that taste the same or better, cost the same or less, and are just as or more convenient than conventional meat. That way, individual consumers don't have to make these really tough choices. They can just have something that's just as tasty and just as cost efficient on their plate. And we focus specifically on solutions that are plant-based, fermentation-derived, and cultivated. So looking at some of the biggest challenges and inefficiencies uh, examined on the previous slides, we can see that alternative proteins generally perform much better across a range of measures. Um, this is especially true for plant-based meat, which I have to call out because I am the plant-based specialist. Um, plant-based meat um, can be made with 23 to 43 times less land, 23 to 50 times less water, and depending on the species of character um, comparison, uh, releases uh, meaningfully less air pollution, toxic chemicals, and greenhouse gas emissions all the way across the board. And similarly, cultivated meat with um, renewable energy also performs a lot better than most conventional meat, especially beef. Um, it is a little bit more resource intensive than plant-based meat, but it's something that we are working on. And it's worthwhile to note that with these numbers, um, GFI um, worked with a consultant company, G uh, C. Delp, and these were very ambitious benchmarks for conventional meat by 2030. So think like Western European style farming. So this wasn't assuming worst case scenario for conventional meat. This is actually kind of considering one of the better scenarios that we're benchmarking against. And we still see that plant-based meat and cultivated meat are much better for the planet. Um, and these are just some estimates for the alternative protein share of gl the global meat market um, in the next coming years. So as of right now, GFI estimates that we hold about 1% of the global meat market alternative proteins. And other places like Cargill, Barclays, McKenzie, Jefferies have um, projected what alternative protein share of the global meat market will be by 2050. Um, rather 2025, 2030, et cetera. And we can see this really big boom of projected demand for our alternative proteins, sharing a huge part of the global meat market space. However, when it comes down to demand, what we really wanna do is again, make a really tasty product and we want it to pay a cost as much or less than conventional products. But really the biggest opportunities that we can win on here are those two of taste and price, closing the price gap. So um, while health and environmental concerns are part of the reason why people look into alternative protein categories, really it comes down to taste and price. So if we look at this, um, these numbers from uh, Mintel reports, we see that US consumers might not wanna eat plant-based meat products because they don't like the taste they think it's too expensive, or maybe they don't like the texture. Additionally, when we look at the price gap as of 2020, we see that plant-based products tend to be much more expensive than animal-based products, so we need to close that gap. But really zeroing in on this taste aspect, this is where alternative fats come in. It's an extremely essential part to the alternative meat experience. Um, as much as we focus on alternative proteins a lot of the time, fats are there to create 
a sensory and nutritional profile that really mimics conventional animal fat and gives that juiciness, that texture, that taste that we would like from conventional um, animal meat, but as an alternative protein product. Currently, coconut oil is really the most commonly used alternative fat, but it has a lot of technical and supply chain challenges, and I'll talk about that really briefly in a second. But really, other alternative fats, fats beyond these tropical oils like coconut oil, we want things that improve cook cookability, texture, structure, and nutritional quality compared to coconut oil and match as closely to conventional animal fat as possible. And so plant-based, fermentation-derived, and cultivated ingredients can all be used to make these alternative fat products. So what is using being used right now? Um, I mentioned tropical oils. So this is like coconut oil, palm oil, cocoa butter. These all have pretty high um, melting temperatures for plant lipids. However, they're still much lower, or they're still lower than um, conventional animal products. And more so the issue is more of their melting profile. Um, while they're getting heated up, they almost melt immediately, whereas animal fat, it really does take a while for it to melt. Um, some technologies that are used currently in industry are like hydrogenation. This is used to make margarines, plant-based margarines, shortening, and it's essentially taking unsaturated lipids in plant oils and turning them into saturated lipids using a catalyst. So it makes those double bonds and unsaturated lipids, lipids into single bonds, into straight chain lipids that can actually act a little bit more like conventional fat. Other things like fractional crystallization, it's not very scalable right now, interesterification that's being used as well, but there's some problems with these three technologies as far as um, uh, really getting to the core of making a conventional fat product. We have some more emerging technologies like oleogels and emulsions, microbial production and cultivated fat production. And while these ones are more promising, maybe on the technical front, we're seeing that as of right now, we do have scalability and cost issues, mostly because these just haven't been explored very much yet. And so luckily we have professors like Dr. Marangoni and some companies as well that are working on these types of solutions. And so here are just a few companies that I wanted to highlight, um, very non-existent lists of companies that are working on alternative fat technology. And I'll just point out a few right now. Um, so there's some plant-based fats as well as fermentation derived and cultivated fats. Um, Motif Foodworks is working on an extrudable plant-based oleo gel that creates marbling and texturing in fats um, for plant-based meats. Uh, Cargill is actually creating a patent pending vegan fat and blood platform that would be used in meat and uh, fish alternatives. Uh, tra Time Traveling Milkmen is a spinoff of a Wagnian University and Research um, and Start Life alumnus, and they're doing scalable plant-based dairy fat. And it's a creamy, unsaturated fat ingredient that's actually made from seed extracted fat droplets. So when it comes down to it, what is really this difference between coconut oil and then conventional um, fat products and what can we do to, to get there? If we really zoom in on animal adipose tissues, we see that they're composed of fatty cells in a collagen fiber matrix. And this is really, really difficult to replicate with other lipids. Not only is the, are the fatty cells filled with saturated fats that really have good solid melting properties, um, but on top of it, they're in this complicated colloidal um, structure. Um, and alternative fats really should have these same, similar types of tr uh, structures to reach taste and texture parity with animal fats. And another um, GFI grantee, so Dr. Marangoni is um, one of our new GFI grantees, and another um, grantee, Dr. Liu, he provided these images for me. Um, he is specifically working on making um, high internal phase emulsions of soy protein and soybean oil to mimic beef adipose tissue. And we can see the confocal microscopy images of adipose tissue from beef here, and then the high internal phase emulsions from the soybean and protein and oil base. And on a macroscopic level, we can see that they really do mimic each other here. And then on top of Dr. Marangoni and Dr. Liu, I did want to highlight a couple of other grantees that are working on um, fermentation-derived fats, rather. And so Dr. Boundy Mills from um, the University of California, Davis, she is working with elaginous yeast, so a fermentation-derived animal fat 
and she's screening culture collections of oleaginosities for fat yield and composition among other food relevant properties. And Dr. Yusuf from um, the University of Malaysia is creating, uh, is using, is leveraging omega-3 fatty acids from microalgae um, to create structured plant-derived fats and proteins that are very healthy, rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And of course, I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about other plant-based ingredients. There's a lot of opportunities um, across the chain. So, I mean, this is the proteins and, and co-products division. So alternative proteins are obviously very, very important for alternative um, uh, protein products, as is alternative fat, carbohydrates, fibers. And if you would like to learn more about these ingredients and different opportunities, I really um, encourage you to look at these um, resources. And I believe you'll be getting a slide deck after this. So um, please take a deep dive onto GFI's website to learn more about the science of plant-based meat, cultivated meat, learn more about our research grants, et cetera. And really there are opportunities across the plant-based value chain. So here I have a value chain going from crop development to ingredient optimization, where you might see some ingredient optimization for fats and oils and then all the way to formulation and manufacturing when we're actually combining all these ingredients together. We have the fats, oils, as well as the proteins and any other ingredient. And we have all these opportunities across the supply chain for everyone who's working on uh, alternative ingredients, but especially fats and oils. You could imagine for crop development, there are some companies who are making omega-3 rich um, crops, for instance, um, things like that, that could really be contributing to the space. And really the current labor force gaps are predominantly research and development roles. So we need scientists like you to step into the plate to work on these alternative protein products so that they're so delicious and we can really capture the meat market in the next few years. Um, these are, uh, this is a very non-exhaustive list, but some of the things, uh, some of the disciplines that might lend themselves to this field. Um, and I highlighted a few that maybe are more um, pertinent to fats and oils, including cellular and molecular developmental biology, chemistry and chemical engineering, fermentation scientists, food science and engineering, material science, but there's really a plethora of different disciplines. And um, just as an example, I will talk a little bit about my path and I am coming from the um, chemistry um, discipline. So um, just so, People know like how, how I got here working um, at GFI. Um, so I did start out in um, with my bachelor's at UC Santa Cruz. I'm a very proud um, banana slug alumni. And um, in at the at UC Santa Cruz, I worked on sensor chemistry, um, doing a lot of organic chemistry synthesis and pattern-based analysis. And this was more for human therapeutic applications. Um, I briefly worked at a startup after my bachelor's degree for about a year, where again, I explored more on sensor chemistry. Here I was doing electrochemistry, some hydrogel synthesis, still really in the human therapeutics um, uh, uh, space and application. I then went to um, UCLA to pursue my PhD in organic chemistry. And here I picked up a lot of skills on material science, organic chemistry, polymer chemistry, agricultural chemistry, analytical chemistry, and nanoscience. I was doing a lot of work on sustainable delivery of agricultural agents um, in, in the environment. So working with um, small molecule herbicides, working with animal feed enzymes, um, really just trying to uh, increase the utilization efficiency of these um, agricultural actives that we use so often. Um, during my PhD, I did do an internship at Bayer Crop Science, where I worked um, even more so on herbicide development. Um, and then I worked in industry um, in post-harvest agriculture, so not really focusing so much on what's happening in the field and how to optimize for that but then to optimize for once we've actually harvested, how can we keep things um, fresher for longer so that we can reduce food waste? Um, I made edible coatings in industry for apples and oranges, and these were plant-based um, coatings and learned a lot of coating chemistry there. And then finally, I came to the Good Food Institute where I was able to apply all of this <laughs> chemistry along the way that I learned um, and I'm really learning more about plant-based ingredients, especially being applied for alternative meats um, and industry analysis and engagement, grant review and resource building with just a really common theme of 
I'm trying so hard to use my technical background so that we can have a just, secure, sustainable food and agriculture system that is rooted in scientific rationale. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Marangoni. I'm going to end the slideshow here and I'm sure this will go without any hiccup. Um, let's see, stop share. All right, take it away, Dr. Marangoni. Great, I'm gonna share my screen and uh... Great. Uh, does everything look okay? Yep, it's great. <clears throat> great. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina and Priera. And uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. I'm going to just go through this because this is in my mind lately. And uh, I think it, it ties in very well with what GFI and uh, is trying to do these days, reimagining meat. But I'm not going to just talk about fats and oils. So uh, I would like to just share with you some, some concerns or views that I have lately. Meat analogs for sure play a key role in the transition from animal-based foods to plant-based foods. This is the way we're gonna convince people to participate in this important transition for the planet. Why do we eat meat analogs in general? We wanna solve the problem, we just eat beans. We don't need to make meat analogs, cheese analogs or anything. Are we wasting our time? No because these products are more indulgent than just stewed seeds and offer a variety in the diet. We have to take our grandiose ideas out of our head. People want variety, people want taste, and the flexitarians particularly are never gonna change if you bore them to tears, including myself. You have to offer this variety in the diet and as much as the, the problem is solved with bean stews, uh, you won't have people really making the transition. So it's very important for us to do this. Um, a, a key structural issue threatened the adoption in the marketplace of both flexitarians and vegetarians. I keep on talking to industry people, three to four dollars a kilo for a kilogram of chicken out of the Brazilian chicken, which is the most efficient protein production in the world, but a pea protein isolate in Switzerland is seven dollars a kilo. So uh, we have to really convince the big manufacturers of proteins to just start producing proteins en masse once we have the, the people willing to eat this plant-based food product. So the whole thing needs to gain momentum forward. Look at that price different. It, that has to change. <clears throat> As uh, GFI said in 2000, uh, the two 2030 report, there isn't enough protein isolate to feed this new industry related now to the price. We have to have large scale protein production by different players. I really think uh, like many companies are beginning to address this, we have to make sure that our protein analogs, our meat analogs have a complete protein. Uh, they do have the nutritional factors that are necessary for growth and development of, of humans <laughs> at different growth stages, i.e. iron, vitamins, the digestibility needs to be addressed. And, uh, and uh, the fact that um, many of these products are considered these days, we see the criticism as being ultra processed foods with containing way too many ingredients. I think, um, I think we cannot ignore these things. We ignore them at our own peril. Um, and we have to address the issue head on and solve the problem. Otherwise, we will not be successful regardless of whatever, whoever thinks whatever. And the sensory, of course, related to the whole thing has to have, these products have to have the texture, flavor, and color uh, that helps people uh, make that transition as well. So all these things need to be there because we don't want to be in a situation in which, according to the GFI report, the growth in meat analogs hasn't been really stellar in the last year. And on the bottom, I don't want to highlight them because I love them and I buy all their products. That's the Beyond Meat stock this year. Um, they're dropping like crazy structural issues related to both cost of the raw materials as well as production issues. But we don't want to see that. We want to see all these companies going up and everybody adopting them. So we all have to do our part to help them be successful. Their success is our success. Now, in order to design a fat, design a meat uh, analog, to me, it's like uh, the way I approach the problem is a inverse problem in complex system design. What does that mean? I like to take the product, touch it, feel it, see it, look at the right. I'm going from right to left. And excuse me, the people who write from right to left in the world, that's the right way I should have it from top to bottom or bottom to top. 
but at least uh, here we write from left to right. So in the right is the product as it is. I want to feel it. I want to know what the rheological properties, the textural properties, sensorial properties. Then I'm going to analyze it and try to understand a little bit what the composition of the product is. For example, here's a fat and we have the fatty acid composition, solid fat content, melting behavior, X-ray diffraction patterns to give us polymorphism. All these things that affect the, and as well the microstructure that would be in there, the nanostructure of it. And I'm going to see maybe how that relates to the thing I saw and I touched. I'm going to do rheological measurements in the small and large amplitude regimes. And I'm going to try to understand what the behavior is telling me as it relates to the functionality and properties of the material. And then you have the structure on the left-hand side that goes all the way from microscopic to sort of that's the nanostructure of the material, which could be part of that composition properties diagram. And then we can loop back and try to, to, uh, to, to basically relate that structure and, and, and rheological properties and microscopic properties to what we see and feel. So uh, this is what we're trying to do. I'll relate it a little bit to fat as quickly as I can. So if we wish to match animal meat texture, we must understand its structure. So here you have fish, you have beef, and you have chicken. They look different, right? So for example, just knowing the composition of these products is not gonna help, not, not gonna help us. All of them are about, uh, what is it, protein? They're about 20% protein. They're between, I don't know, up to 10, 14% fat. Um, and they have a certain amount of water. Maybe they're in the range from uh, 60 to 80%. Does that really tell us what these things here are? I don't think so. The structure is the key. So if we look at a piece of beef, of muscle tissue. Look at this on the right. So we're going to talk a little bit about fats, but developing an oil, as, uh, as Pierre already said, they're funding somebody who's looking at the structure of the material is critical. Fat and oil don't exist as such in these uh, meat analogs. Well, <laughs> they shouldn't exist as, as such in these meat analogs. They need to exist in a structure that looks like that. Look at this. And there's not even one structure. You have intramuscular fat, but you also have intramuscular fat, those little veins of fat that are throughout the tissue as well. To complicate matters further, the protein part of it is not just protein in it. It's not just a gel. It has structure. And it's not only fibers. Meat analogs are not only fibers. They have a structure themselves. You have the fibers, the myofibrils, that come together and they form muscle fibers. Then there's bundles of these fibers. Then there's sheath, a sheath of connective tissue around them. And look, they're like bundles of bundles of bundles of material. All of this with this connective tissue. That's what we, there's muscle, of course. That's what we call muscle. There's connective tissue, muscle bundles, muscle fibers, myofibrils. There's tendon material in there. And as well, some bone to make it even more interesting. And here's the very complex hierarchy that we just talked about that gives meat its particular texture and hence sensory properties. And all in there, the fat is interspersed. Now, I just showed you beef. I'm just trying to be like the devil's advocate here. We also have another type of meat, which is fish. So the fish looks very different from the beef. Oh, did I forget to tell you about veins and all the other things that should be in muscle? Well, let's not complicate it too much, but look at the fish. In the fish, the protein and the fat are laid out completely differently. You have here, this is the side view of a fish, poor fish got cut in half. Um, um, here you have subcutaneous fat, ventral adipose tissue, subcutaneous dorsal adipose tissue. You have white muscle and red muscle and pink muscle in here. And look how the muscle is laid out in this like sheaths. I believe they're called uh, myomeres separated by the myoseptum. So maybe this is like a laminated product, little lamella one on top of each other connected by this myoseptum. And uh, the structure that which is laid out is not only straight lines, maybe this curvature has something to do with the fact, you know, when you take a fork and you break a little piece of fish, it breaks into little chunks that correspond to some bundle of these things. So structure is the key here. We could go even further and say, if we really wanted to match the functionality of, uh, or the texture of different fishes, we got to lay these down at the, in different patterns. Look how this, uh, Shipjack juna, a tuna pattern looks like this laminate shark or this non thuniform fish. If we really want to match structures, we probably got to get creative about how we design the material. Very quickly, I would like to talk about maybe a new way of looking at structuring meat. 
And it's a great paper by He et al that I've, I came out in advanced analysis of uh, sustainable systems uh, last year, material perspective on the structural design of artificial meat. And their point was this, if they, they, they're, they're suggesting that we start thinking about fabricating this meat in more of a material science kind of terms. And in that, their big proposal, I'll just go through it very quickly, is that we have two ways of doing it. One of them is uh, by prefabricating a soup or using a, a supporting structure, or the supporting structure is created in situ. And um, so there's prefabrication and postfabrication. And I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Look at this plant cells that have been decellular, decellularized, spin uh, electrospun patterns of things that look like, like foams, like aerogels. Uh, you can do a synthetic material, but either way, what we're trying to create is a scaffolding that looks like the connective tissue. And what are we gonna fill it with? We could fill it with protein, we could fill it with fat. And look at this exciting thing, even for uh, the growth of myofibril cells, what if you grow your meat cells, you know, the cultured meat thing, inside these pores? You could achieve alignment, and the creation of connective tissue, which all these cell-grown meats don't have anyways, right? They're just a bunch of cells. That's not gonna solve our problem. We need to put them in the context of a structure. And the other one is down here is where the supporting structure is created at the same time as the fibrous structure like you do in extrusion or shear processing. So prefabricated or post-built. So prefabricated, uh, prefabricate supporting pore structure, which will resemble a connective tissue filled with other components. Natural supporting structures from vegetarian sources. Listen to this. Dried mushrooms, filamentous fungi, spirulina multicellular helicodal filaments, plant polysaccharides, tubular structures, plant tissues that you remove the cell interior so you open them up, carrots, celeries, broccolis, apples. Um, and uh, they resemble very much a prop. They give you the mechanical properties of the paramecium and, and morphology of the epimecium in meat. And you can actually make synthetic supporting structures, spinning, uh, directional freeze thaw. When you freeze thaw, you create holes, or you freeze dry and you create also orientation. So you can get really creative with these scaffoldings. Everybody did that with the bioengineering of human tissue. And uh, maybe it's a time for us to think about a practical and cheap way of doing it in meat analogs. So here an example, um, I'll tell you about networks of proteins that are here. They're called them amyloid fibers, beta lactoglobulin, for example. You can make these linear proteins that then you can somehow fill with stuff. And here you have something that is, uh, I believe this one here was the, 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 the freeze dried one. And this one here, C is, uh, um, well, there's a dried and freeze dried versions of these things that you can actually make this alignment, these structures that you can fill with material. That's a prefabricated. In the post fabricated system, you have two main systems that are used to create fibrous structures in meats. One of them is the high moisture extrusion that we're all familiar with, the other one is shear processing. While you create these fibrous structures, you're also inherently creating a supporting structure in situ. That has different levels of success, and it depends on a lot of physical chemistry and compatibility of polymers, blah, blah, blah. You could probably have two different materials in there that do that. It's a little less controlled. And uh, if you have ever tasted one of these products, yes, they have some mechanical response that resembles uh, that of chicken and stuff, but it's just not completely there, particularly the fat filling is not very good. So what are some of these new building blocks? Here you have protein fibers double networks of two different uh, polysaccharides. No, this was soy protein and sugar beet pectin. And one of them is more cross-linked than the other one. So you can just play around with those two things and have double, triple networks of polymers that are present in there and you can fill them and that will give you different mechanical properties. And believe it or not, oleogels, he quoted the oleogels of ethyl cellulose in oil being as a possibility as well to provide some structure that resembles that picture of meat that we had before. Interestingly, about this whole concept of creating these scaffoldings, we have the whole people from, like, for example, Redefine Meat in Israel, that they create a more macro structure by 3D printing. Their approach to the problem is not to create a scaffolding and fill it with whatever, or do the uh, post build with extrusion or shear processing, but to actually draw it. 
So they basically draw it there and that's how it looks. My question is, I think they've had a very good measure of success. Is that enough to fool the humans to, to believe that you have all these hierarchical structures and they are not? I, I think they're doing really well. I do not know whether the length scale is just not small enough, right? It's just not sufficient structure at the small scale. However, fantastic idea of trying to create those structures somehow. Remember, muscle is not only aligned fibers. So the whole idea about creating the scaffolding is you make a network, the network needs to have some anisotropy, and maybe you can design some hierarchy, and that will in part, in, 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 in turn, affect the stiffness of the product, think about stretching something, the strength of the product, think about breaking the product, and the toughness as we chew, 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 then you actually have some residual structure that is shown here that gives you that chewiness that you want from the, from the material, i.e. the meat analog. And as you bite into the material initially, you, you very much have to understand how the uh, stiffness of the material affects that, where the, uh, where, where the material breaks, and as well beyond the yield point, what the toughness of the material is based on the design of your scaffolding and the filling material. And here are some of the uh, uh, hydrogels with a line and stronger structures of yet or obtained by a, you can dry it in a certain direction and create structure. So you don't have to be fabricating. You can dry these polysaccharides directionally and create some of these tubular pore structures. You can also do um, uh, drying in a confined condition, new cross-linking along the side chains. As you can see here, now we can cross-link. Some people use enzymes to cross-link polymers. Uh, mechanical training. Uh, stretch training, you basically align the material under a shear field or under, under flow, or stretching. There's a lot of artisanal making of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of these kind of meat analogs that just involve people stretching the material, stretching the material, stretching the material. And um, if, if it can be combined with some cross-linking, then it, it will be advantageous. Here we have an example. You're the first ones to see this. These are Zane fibers in a protein uh, starch matrix that have been created just by stretching. Uh, there's no extrusion, there's no shear processing, it's done uh, just by stretching. And that, that's uh, the biomedical imaging beamline at the Canadian light source synchrotron. And uh, those green things are, the green long things are Zane fibers. Um, and in the end, of course, we all need more support to be able to uh, do accurate fabrication and assembly of these scaffolding structures uh, modeling, final element simulation, structure quality relationships along the whole value chain of structure from nanoscale to mesoscale to macro scale. Um, and uh, I'm going to very briefly then, so we're filling them with different things. I'm going to give you the two minute version of scientific and technological advances in fats, um, which include fat mimetics and biotechnology, just one slide structural view of fats um, have helped us, our work that we've done in our lab and other people to understand what the structure of a fat material is from molecules to nanoscale structure, to microscale structure, to networks that are being formed to the final piece of fat. We have now this very clear what the hierarchy of the material is. Can we do that with a fat mimetic? I don't like to call them oleogels anymore because we're talking about fat mimetics. Here we have a direct oil structuring when a material self-assembles like ethyl cellulose or small, small molecules, amphiphiles form oleogels directly, but we can actually fill dried foam polysaccharides, foam dried polysaccharides with oil, or we can make an emulsion and dry it, emulsion filled gels, or we can make structure by phasic systems like a, such as the high internal phase emulsions that you talked about, this is a high internal phase emulsion that we developed in early 2000 and patented, and it's been used in industry for a while for, for, for cookies, not for fats, but, um, but uh, we did that with monoglycerides, not with proteins. All of these are very valid strategies to try to get to the fat to replace palm oil and more unsustainable fats and try to match functionalities. The GFI, thank you, is funding us for the enzymatic glycerolysis of oils of fats to replace palm oil in food products based on a nature paper that we put out in 2020. And the idea here is just to take any oil source, add glycerol, add an enzyme and make monoglycerides and diglycerides from the oil. You're not changing chemical composition. You can use any type of oil. Well, some work better than others and you make mags and dags. And notice how 
uh, in time, the monoglycerides and diglycerides accumulate in the material. Uh, there's also different types of monoglycerides. Notice how the solid fat content increase in time as a function of this, while the oil loss goes down and uh, while well, the oil loads. So by creating this mono and dax in situ without any further refining, we are under conditions of low free fatty acid accumulation. Now we converted an oil made of triglycerides to a fat made of monoglycerides and diglycerides, mostly diglycerides, about 50% diglycerides, a diglyceride oil. And it all comes, a lot of the structuring from the creation of the monoglyceride structuring agents that you can see growing as a peak, as a high melting peak um, um, as the reaction goes on. And I just wanted to show you some examples, forget these three, but look at the solid fat content of cottonseed oil. Once you do the glycerolysis, you go from something that is pretty much liquid after 15 to look at this monster of solid fat content. No, and no added saturated fat, no hydrogenation, no palm oil, just the glycerolysis, boom, up. Tiger nut margarine. Also, we were very successful in taking tiger nuts. Now you can do small scale stuff. Every company could do an enzymatic transformation and create their own solid fat from a particular liquid oils. Here we made a margarine with tiger nuts. I didn't know what those things were before with very similar melting behavior as a commercial margarine and with a solid fat content temperature profile that resembles it too. We also managed to match with the glycerolysis with the rice brand glycerolysis product, lean ground meat tallow in their melting behavior. Look at the red and, red and the green lines. And we also could mesh, mix it with, uh, with uh, the tiger nut glycerolysis product, mix uh, with a 50-50 coconut sunflower that many companies uh, obtain. Um, and look, the matching is actually, I would say that our tiger nut product is better. And look at peanut oil. You could also increase the solids to the point where you don't have any more natural peanut butter separation by doing that. Many oils can be used. Notice that all these increases, some better than others, tiger nut, peanut, cotton seed, rice bran, even look at olive oil. The other ones, soybean didn't do that well, just a little bit. Some of them don't work at all. And it depends on some composition that I can talk to you about. Another option for organogels are also waxes, just to give an example of what direct oleogelation can do. And that's a 3% plant-based wax combination, rice bran and, uh, and uh, rice bran and sunflower waxes. And we have now a olive oil butter um, present. And finally, this great, I hope you continue uh, telling people to keep on working on oleogenous yeast and maybe oleogenous fungi in the, in the future. The sky's the limit with these things as long as you can figure out how to extract the oil in an economic way. We have now Dr. Ghazani's product um, uh, project is we have a very nice yeast that can produce, uh, we have right now 28% um, uh, palmitic and 14% uh, steric, so we're up to 42% saturates out of these oleogenous yeasts that are non-GMO. And uh, we're just playing, we're not funded by anybody. We're just playing with this just to uh, get the problem solved and put it out there. And um, the future, the future is beyond burgers, ha ha ha. For sure, not beyond, beyond burgers. We need to make uh, things, exciting things. I'm excited by Quorum uh, using mushroom high feet scaffolds. They're using scaffolds. Uh, here's your internal scaffold from uh, uh, by extrusion. The experts is extrusion of planted out of Switzerland. They make some amazing chicken products, but look where they're going. That's a piece of chicken. They were not going to tell you what it is, but it should be a nice little piece of chicken that looks like the real thing. Who knows what they're doing? Then we also have this meaty steaks. They look very similar. And this new company called Nosh Biofoods, uh, they're actually designing mycelial masses for scaffolding for structuring fat cells and proteins. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, both Pri and Alejandro for those presentations. Um, I'm super energized after listening to them and also just looking at the chat at just the plethora of super cool backgrounds people have in the audience. Um, I'm really excited to dive into our Q&A now. So, um, Thanks to everyone that already submitted questions um, through the Q&A function. Um, and as we uh, uh, go through this Q&A session, please feel free to keep um, submitting questions. Um, so we'll dive in to, um, I guess I'll go in order, starting from some of the questions that were asked earlier on um, during Pri's presentation. So um, the first one we have here um, kind of relates to the uh, 
environmental impact. So for the comparisons for environmental impact to uh, current conventional meat, uh, where does seafood stack up? Yes, this is an excellent question. And I know that I won't be able to do it justice as much as my colleagues who have been working on these um, state of the industry reports focused on seafood. And there's also an accompanying webinar, if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, that it's pretty short and sweet, and it really goes over these in, in great detail. Um, but essentially what it comes down to is the metrics aren't necessarily like one-to-one. -one. Like obviously when we're looking at seafood, we aren't caring so much about land use, right? Um, however, we know that um, uh, overfishing has been affecting our populations of fish. Um, and we know that um, aqua, aquaculture um, or like doing things farming rather than open ocean can also lead to pollution issues and, um, and similar greenhouse gas issues. Um, but yeah, I really recommend going into a deep dive on that webinar to look more at these aquatic species and, and how that levels up. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, I'll also throw in that, um, in terms of uh, plastic, reducing fishing activity, I think is the most significant way to reduce plastic pollution. So if we're looking at uh, environmental impact from, um, from that perspective, then that's something to note too. Um, I'll move on to the next question. This one is also about sustainability. Um, so in terms of sustainability, which is more of a priority between eating local foods to reduce emissions from transportation or eating plant-based foods with ingredients um, possibly from all over the world? This is a um, tricky question. I would say yes, both. But that being said, like there are studies that show that transportation is really just a uh, drop in the bucket of what's happening with conventional animal agriculture as far as greenhouse gas emissions go and um, in other parameters. So while sourcing food locally is really, really commendable and it helps with biodiversity and making sure that we have good ecosystems where we're living. Um, the transportation costs of food really doesn't contribute nearly as much as the conventional animal agriculture. So really it's not too much of a comparison. Plant-based is the best way to go. That being said, I would definitely encourage people to still, you know, buy your plant-based products, um, you know, go to your local farmer's market and things like that um, it, as well. But um, but definitely plant-based, even if it's across from the globe, is going to be um, better for the environment. Cool. Thanks for that answer, Pri. Um, I'll jump down to a few of the questions that were um, posed during Alejandro's presentation. So um, this one asks, um, I'd love to learn more about the types of equipment, um, both scientific instruments and hospitality industry appliances that um, uh, might be crucial to the plant-based meat production process, uh, both today and in the future. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? That that is a very good question. It seems like right now the uh, the status quo. Is, I mean, what everybody's doing is buying an extruder. Everybody who is not, um, I mean, who wants to get in, it seems to it seems to think that. An extruder is the way to go. With the extruder, you make little chunks of material via high moisture extrusion, which are better for burgers uh, than the uh, the old uh, old school texturized vegetable protein. So you you either need to make little chunks by HME, or but the real next challenge is to make tissue, is to make the strips of chicken, and eventually, can you imagine making like a schnitzel or like the people in plant that do? like a whole tissue. But for that, you're going to have to incorporate the other elements of the whole tissue. And that has not been solved yet to include the adipose tissue with the fat in it and maybe other, other things. So an extruder seems to be the way to go. We really need to develop technologies other than extrusion because extrusion requires a high capital investment uh, to get in. But anybody who wants to go in needs to buy an extruder. So that's, that's, the, that's the sort of easy answer to that. Cool, thanks for that explanation. And um, a follow-up, uh, this person says, maybe a silly question for some of these scientists. And to that I say, no, <laughs> no silly questions here. Please feel free to ask any questions that this person is asking. Um, how do you perform the uh, glycerolysis? Uh, no, <laughs> I might have just butchered that. 
um, what equipment and conditions are required for that? Uh, we started doing the glycerolysis by, uh, and it, it, it you require a bucket, oil, glycerol, and the enzyme. That's it. And you just got to stir and stir and stir. If you don't have a stir, stay there for like 24 hours and swirl it around for 24 hours. And it needs to be heated to the, the optimal temperature of an enzyme. In this case, believe it or not, it's something like 60 degrees. Uh, the main cost in here is the cost of the enzyme, which if it's done at scale, there's Novozymes, other companies that produce enzymes, you can do it. But all you need is a stir tank reactor to make that. If you, you can get into more sophisticated configurations, but ultimately a tank, a stir, glycerol, oil, an enzyme, and you heat it up to 60 degrees, which is not too bad. You can do it with hot water and you stir it around until the reaction's finished. Christina. You're on mute, Christina. <laughs> no, okay. So I'm really <laughs> passionate about what you were saying though. <laughs> I know, I don't even remember now. No. Um, this last question was asked um, after both of your presentations. So I think I was just saying, either of you feel free to jump in. Um, this person asks, are Alia gels currently used in any food products and what level is um, intrastrification in the industry used to optimize the fatty acid composition of fats? And what are the challenges with this technology? And that's an extremely good question. Uh, the one, um, the one oleo gel that is allowed uh, by the USDA is ethyl cellulose, believe it or not, and it only took a petition from the manufacturer Dow to do it. So it wasn't that difficult. You can make an oleo gel with 5% ethyl cellulose in any oil, and it can be used as a fat substitute. Um, I know that waxes can also be used, uh, but they're used as glazing agents and coating agents. Um, a lot of people are work. I'm sure that there's petitions right now to allow, it would have to be, can you, can I use a uh, 5% wax in oil as a fat substitute? And then the USDA would tell you, yes, up to 5%. Now that we have the precedent of ethyl cellulose gels, those are really the only one that are, that are per se allowed as a fat substitute. We can, um, we can do the other ones. However, if you don't want to go the other way, think about the fat substitute made by a scaffolding that is filled with the oil, you don't need permission for that. That's just an edible polysaccharide that has been made porous and the oil in there. So you have made, or an emulsion that has been dried. That's also an oleo gel. Um, people are looking very much and using it as adipose tissue. Like there's a huge thrust for that. That's the only reason you really use it, right? Is, uh, is, is for that adipose tissue application. Great, and this next question is, in the case of freeze drying, um, how much of the fibril structure is affected by protein source versus the, uh, the freeze drying process? It, no, the it's not really a fiber formation and drying. It was a macroscopic holes. Remember, we used that to create, sorry, I was going too fast. It's the scaffolding. It's like when you dry a material and it becomes like porous. So if you have directional freezing, the crystals will glow in one direction. And then when you freeze dry them away or you dry them away, they, uh, they, 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 they leave the channel. We're trying to make channels. And that channel, we're gonna fill with stem cells, with proteins and stuff. So they'll have that banding that, that, that you have in there. So uh, th that was the thing about the drying. It's like, can we create structure? On the other hand, you take a carrot, you dry it down, you already have all the holes made. You, you fill carrot pumice dried, I would even oven dry it with oil and see how much of it is retained inside or work on strategies to make a, an, an open cell or close open cell foam that retains the oil inside. And now you have your adipose tissue. Great. So we have five more minutes for this Q&A. Um, so Pri and Alejandro, if there are questions that you see um, that you're really excited about answering, please um, bump those and, and we can uh, go through those. Otherwise, I'll just go in, in order. Um, so this next one is, um, to what extent does processing methods used to produce these fat um, affect the oxidation of oils, particularly at scale? Um, for example, ethyl cellulose, you have to be careful. You need to heat it up to like 130 degrees to get the ethyl cellulose in, and then you gel it down and we're all good. However, that heating process can be, can be deleterious. So we always use an antioxidant like tocopherols. We always minimize the time 
uh, but more exciting, we're developing also antioxidant oleogels. So the oleogel that combines the oleogel material that also functions then as, as an antioxidant. So I challenge you, yes, the processing can affect it, but if I put it in an oleogel system that is an antioxidant system, you can now preserve hemp seed oil forever not forever, <laughs> for long enough so that it doesn't go bad on you when you really need it. So yes, but, um, but the judicious use of antioxidants and choosing certain fibers that have antioxidant potential. And remember, a lot of plant materials are full of phenolics. So you can imagine if you dry down and open up a plant tissue uh, without removing the cell contents, you'll have a lot of antioxidants in there. So you can actually stabilize oils inside oleogels, depending on who, what you choose. Cool. And I think that actually answered a lot of the questions we had in here about um, shelf life. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else you want to say about um, shelf life of plant-based meats, um, feel free. Otherwise, I'll move on. Um, let's see, this one says, this new technology um, is cool and efficient, but how about awareness and training people for this or um, making commercial supplies available on commercial scale? Um, are there enough suppliers to, um, I guess, to supply this entire industry? I don't know if, uh, well, is there, I mean, it, seriously, I mean, we, we need to start producing these things at scale. So first, what has to happen is focus on a few technologies that make commercial sense, because there's a lot of, remember, a lot of research is just for the fun of it, right? It doesn't really have to, to really solve the economic problem. So we have to really pare it down to uh, commercially viable technologies and then work with partners. I do that quite a bit. I'm sure everybody does it and convince them. Somebody has to convince the big guys to start producing more protein, to start producing uh, fat analogs. So no, that has not happened. That hasn't happened for uh, just protein isolates yet. So absolutely, that, that needs to happen. How it's going to happen? I'm thinking almost the other strategy is to make technologies in which small is beautiful, that people could do themselves. For example, the glycerolysis reaction, I'm not saying that you should use it. You, you, know, you don't have to pay me anything. Uh, you just do it in your backyard, do it in for the company. You have your own glycerolysis of your oil. I bet you that can be economically feasible. So we either empower people to go small scale like solar panels in your house. No, you, you, it, it's a weird concept, right? or you convince one of the big guys to start producing it for you. And uh, it hasn't happened yet. Oh, that's a really interesting answer. Um, let's see, with our final um, couple of minutes, um, I think I noticed the people in the chat saying they were doing some research on um, plant-based cheese. So there is a question here about uh, plant-based cheese structure. Um, is there, anything different in terms of thinking about plant-based cheese structure um, as opposed to uh, muscle structure? Absolutely. I have five people working on plant-based cheese myself with a lot of companies. I think, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think, uh, yeah, we have made a lot of progress, but the only advice I have for you is inverse problem design, match the functionality and not the composition the melting, stretching, oil binding properties of a piece of cheese do not have to be given by the protein element in it. Think functionality and do your best to be nutritionally, you know, like good about it, but the matching does not have to be the traditional material matching. This is a, it's, it's a bio replacement with different inputs, right? It's not a drop-in solution. Oh, I have caseins. <laughs> protein in there. So just keep that in mind. Awesome. With that, we've reached the top of the hour. So thank you again, um, Pri and Alejandro, for those uh, awesome presentations and for answering um, these great questions from the audience. Um, and thank you for the audience for participating. Um, so if you, anyone would like to learn more about careers in the alternative protein field, um, I encourage you to visit uh, gfi.org slash vocation. I'll drop a link in the chat. And any researchers, um, I encourage you to join or check out our collaborative researcher directory um, where you can connect with other folks looking to apply their background to the field. Um, so again, thank you to AOCS for organizing this event. Um, we so greatly appreciate it. Um, if you haven't already, I would recommend saving the chat because there was a lot of good contact information in there and a lot of good opportunities people mentioned too. So 
thank you all again, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.